Hello, Internet. I'm Evan Dushevsky, Features Editor with PCMag.com. Welcome to the convo. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about robots. Now, in the last decades, our robots have really evolved, so to speak. They've learned to walk, to drive, to fly, to jump, and even to show some signs of creativity, which we will get to later. Okay, so if you combine advancements in hardware with the huge jumps in AI and machine learning that we've seen recently, we can kind of see how the robots we've long been promised by science fiction might actually begin to take shape. Okay, so to help us learn a little bit more about this new robotic frontier is this man who is not a robot, we're pretty sure. Dr. Hod Lipson is an award-winning researcher, a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia University, where he directs the Creative Machines Lab, and his new book is Driverless, Intelligent Cars and the Road Ahead. Dr. Lipson, welcome to The Convo. My pleasure to be here. Okay, so for those of you at home, the show's called The Convo, not The Dialogue. So if you're watching live on Facebook and you have any questions, drop them in the comments, and social people will read them throughout the show. Uh, if you're watching this later or you're listening to the podcast and you have a question, you know, tough luck. Okay. So, Dr. Lipson, before we jump into any of the very cool stuff that we're going to talk about, I'll start with the fundamentals. What is the definition of a robot? Oh, you won't get a definition uh, okay. coherently from any roboticist. Right, we won't right, right. argue about it. But basically, it's a, it's a, it has two things. It's okay. uh, programmable and it moves. Okay. And you have things that are programmable but don't move, like a cell phone. You have things that move but are not programmable, mm -hmm. like, a, like an old car. Yeah. But then when you put two things together, software and something mm -hmm. that moves, you get a robot. You get a driverless car, for example. Right, right. Robot. So driverless cars is going to be the robots that are going like, to change everything. And we'll, we're going to talk some driverless cars later, too. Um, is an elevator a robot? So uh, elevators usually aren't particularly programmable. So, uh -huh. you know, very minimally you can... Right. Uh, but So the moment you can really program a machine uh -huh. to do motions under software control, that's when it really becomes a robot. And mm -hmm. the more it's programmable, the more it's uh, sort of free, the more degrees of freedom it mm -hmm. has, the more it's a robot. Gotcha. Okay, so now you're the director of the Creative Machines Lab at Columbia University. Now, people don't usually uh, associate creativity with machines. Um, what's the goal of the, the Creative Machines so, Lab? So, you know, we chose that, that name deliberately yeah. because we wanted to sort of actually highlight this, this dissonance between mm -hmm. creativity and machines yeah. and this idea that, you know, most people think that creativity is sort of uniquely human. It's mm -hmm. something that, uh, well, machines can automate, can be automated, they can do all kinds of things repetitive, but when it comes to creativity, curiosity, mm -hmm. those kinds of things, they're really sort of uniquely hum human. So we thought, you know, let's, let's try to tackle that yeah. challenge and see how far we can go. So what we're trying to focus there uh, basically are, uh, is on two things. One is uh, can we make machines that can make other machines? Mm -hmm. Can we make machines that are creative? Yeah. Uh, that can that, that can create other machines and and can we also make machines that can we design machines that can design other machines uh -huh. in other words can we make uh, machines that are creative so right. we're looking at sort of the mechanical element of creation putting things together but also uh, sort of the the creative aspect of, uh, mm -hmm. of making things. Uh, you can see some of the projects that uh, they've worked on at, at creativemachineslive.com, very cool stuff. And we're going to talk about a, a few of these projects, but no, this one's here. So let's talk about this very, uh, for those who are listening, I'm going to describe it. It's a very frightening black spider robot with four legs. Can you maybe describe a little about, about what I'm holding right here? So this is, uh, I think, a third generation of one of our uh, self-aware robots. So okay. what we're trying to do here is try to create uh, robots that are sort of minimally self-aware. Uh -huh. What that means is that they begin to form an image of themselves. Okay. So what that happens is that the, this robot has software on it that begins, it begins sort of randomly flailing around. Mm -hmm. And after about a period of four days, it begins to form an image oh. of itself. Uh -huh. So in the beginning, it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know that it has four legs. It doesn't even know that it's a spider. It doesn't know if it's a snake, if it's a tree. It has no clue what it actually is. But over a period of about four days, mm -hmm. uh, it begins to form this sort of image. And we can sort of see how it begins to figure out that it has legs, doesn't know how many, doesn't know where they're connected. And after about a period of four legs, mm -hmm. it, um, it uh, basically understands what it is. It has a pretty good self-image, not accurate. Uh -huh. And then it uses that self-image to plan. So basically it figures out how to walk in its imagination and then it walks away. So wow. when you're looking at this from the side, from the outside, you can see a robot flailing, flailing around for four days mm -hmm. and then walking away because it created a self-image. Uh -huh. So uh, you know, to test this, we did something uh, very cruel. We chopped off a leg okay, and okay. we watched what happened. We yeah. put it back as yeah. you can see, so yeah. everything's good. But uh, and in about a period of one day, it 
its self-image also loses a leg, wow. and then it begins to limp. So it doesn't limp because somebody programmed it to limp. Mm -hmm. There's no sensor that said leg came off, switch to plan B. Mm -hmm. But instead, the leg came off, the dynamics changed, the self-image changed, and the mm -hmm. behavior changed. So we're trying to make really um, machines that, that understand what they are uh -huh. uh, and sort of use that self-image to do things. So, you know, this is a very simple robot. This is not self-awareness, uh -huh. so if it doesn't wake up in the morning and say hello. Well, let's but, just, but you can sort yeah. of see where this is going. Let's just jump over. Uh, you had one fascinating term, which we should discuss. You said imagination. So the, um, when you're saying imagination in regards to this machine, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this idea that this machine has a concept of what it itself is. Okay. And, and this is, you know, this, I'm, I'm using the, world, the word imagination loosely, okay. but, you know, we all have some kind of image of what we are, uh -huh. what we can do. But, you know, if you, if you can imagine yourself walking on the beach tomorrow, if you can smell the ocean, if mm -hmm. you can feel the sand, you sort of have some kind of image of yourself, yeah. which includes what you can do, what you're going to sense, uh, all these things, even in an experience that you haven't actually had yet. Mm -hmm. This is what this robot has. It has this ability to create an image of itself. Yeah. Um, but, you know, most robots today, factory robots certainly, uh -huh don't have an image of themselves. They're, pre they're programmed on the outside. They're very sort of robotic. Right, right, right. But, uh, but that, the future is heading towards machines that program themselves, and mm. this, is, this is what this is doing. Fascinating. Uh, Facebook, I see you have a question. Uh, what do you think about Bill Gates' idea that companies should pay taxes for the robots that take humans' jobs? Uh, this just came out yesterday. I don't know if you – did you hear the news about this? Uh, no, I haven't heard that particular okay. idea. But, yeah. Uh, Oh, so the, I'll just give you the, the rundown. Is so he was giving a speech saying that um, you know robots are going to replace human jobs. That's a big thing. That's a big topic of concern. Uh, but his idea was that uh, the companies should pay a tax every time they re replace a human with uh, with a machine. I don't know. Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I think in general, uh, what where this is heading yeah. is this idea called uh, universal basic income. Sure, yeah. So you you sort of tax uh, companies based on productivity, and you mm -hmm. take that. Uh, that tax tax uh, tax income, mm -hmm. and you distribute it amongst uh, everybody, yeah. uh, including people who don't work. Right, right, and right. so that's a, that's a sort of the basic idea: how you exactly, uh, you know, yeah. how do you, how do you actually collect that tax, and yeah. what is it based on? This is already a specific idea, yeah. which I think might be actually difficult to implement because people will start arguing yeah. about what job, uh, how much of the job was is new and how much was the job was created. So generally speaking, however, I think that is mm -hmm. indeed, uh, so in the long term, the only real approach. We'll have mm -hmm. a lot of productivity, we'll have a lot of good things, a lot mm -hmm. of wealth created, and mm -hmm. we have to find ways to redistribute those, mm -hmm. uh, this wealth amongst a lot of, amongst everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's certainly one way to do that. Um, so are we, we, you were mentioning earlier uh, robots that self-replicate, that build themselves. Uh, would you, do you have the clip ready? I just want to show, we're going to show you a quick clip of um, one of the robots, these kind of like modular robot that it, it ends up building itself and replicating itself. It's really cool. So roll the clip when you're. Whoa, freaky, right? Okay. So Dr. Lipson, uh, what did we just see there? So what uh, we saw there was a, a, a robot made of four cubes uh -huh. that, given a supply of cubes, will assemble a new robot that's identical to itself. That uh -huh. new robot can then go again and assemble yet another robot that's right, right. identical. So these two robots can assemble two more. These mm -hmm. four robots can assemble four more, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And the basic idea there is that you know, self-reproduction is, again, one mm -hmm. of these holy things that we think, okay, only biology can do. Right. Machines don't self-replicate. They can, can't even self-repair. But that's not true. It's all a question of how we design the machines. And we can design machines mm -hmm. uh, uh, such that they can reproduce, they can self-repair, and mm -hmm. so forth. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, if we plan to send, for example, machines on uh, interstellar uh, journeys, mm -hmm. we can't assume they're going to always want to work. They have to be able to repair themselves. They have to be able to reuse materials and mm -hmm. create better versions of themselves. So this idea of machines adapting, self-repairing, self-reproducing is going to be essential to any sort of mm -hmm. long-term uh, planetary mission that we might uh, think about. But mm -hmm. in general, you know, if you again look uh, maybe a thousand years forward, there's no way we can still still keep building robots the, mm -hmm. You know, by, by assembling raw materials and then you know, putting it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. We really have to think about ways in which 
we can reuse the parts of the robots and mm -hmm. robots can build other robots and then take the robots apart and, and build new robots out of those, much more like biology works. Mm -hmm. Biology is all about reusing materials. Right. Uh, you and I are all made of parts that was previously uh, amino acids in, in plants and other animals and we're using, so that we keep on reusing the same building blocks to make life over and over again mm -hmm. and we want to see the same thing in a sort of a, a future ecology of robotic systems. Well, that well. brings up a fascinating point mm -hmm. is if, a, if you have a set of robots that are able to power themselves, to rebuild themselves, to repair themselves, are they alive? I think uh, it begins to uh, blur the line yeah. of, of uh, where, what is alive and what is not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already, you know, in many people's uh, mind when they see a robot that has uh, googly eyes yeah. and can, is warm and smile, it be already begins to be, uh, you know, have very much, uh, very many sort of uh, lifelike qualities. Right. But I think, uh, I think sort of, you know, if I have to look forward maybe a hundred years, we'll yeah. definitely be in a situation where robots will have so many lifelike qualities that it will be very difficult to make a distinction, it mm -hmm. will be difficult to understand what's ethical mm -hmm. in terms of treatments of robots and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, would, I would even argue that at some point, robots will have some aspect that will surpass humans wow. in terms of emotions and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and feelings. I mean, there's no reason to believe humans are necessarily the ultimate uh, intelligence and mm -hmm. there's nothing else uh, possible beyond that. So mm -hmm. I think we'll, we'll definitely, if not us, then our grandchildren or grandchildren's grandchildren yeah. will have to deal with this question in a very, very concrete way. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing that you are working on is, is the creative part of making these machines. Now, you come from a software background as well as a, a hardware background, um, is that you're creating machines that are creative. Now, this is actually very disturbing to me because one of the things is that, like, oh, robots can do these simple tasks, but if they can also come up with, you know, creative solutions to things, like, then are human, humans even special anymore? So one project in particular, uh, you kind of created a robot artist so you repurposed, if you want to step over here, repurposed a um, uh, like kind of machine arms from an industrial setting, gave it a paintbrush, and used AI to kind of help it create uh, some paintings. So if you see here on the screen, um, there are various examples of this project's uh, artwork, which is kind of cool. I mean, I would have swore that these were made by a human, uh, but, but they're not. They're made by a robot, giant robotic arm. Can you maybe describe a bit about the project and kind of show what it, what's, what's going on here? So, so this is really a project that's been going on for a couple of years now, yeah. uh, where we have a robot that's holding a paintbrush. So this is not graphics, uh -huh. computer graphics. It's not so printing it. It's not yeah, printing yeah. it. It's really holding a paintbrush yeah. and it's painting oil on canvas. It can take, a picture can, here can take uh, maybe 48, 72 hours to paint. Mm -hmm. And it's going and it's creating these... Uh, these paintings, and you know, this is this is one of the earliest paintings that it did, uh, and uh, you can sort of see how it's uh, putting these uh, different uh, paint strokes together. Yeah, that's uncontrolled. Uh, uh, this is yeah. uh, this is a painting of my cat, and it's actually pretty interesting when you're up. This is about uh, four by four uh, uh -huh. feet or three by four. When you get close to it, it's very difficult to see mm -hmm. what the cat uh, that it's a cat. But when you step back, you can sort of see really the, the, the gaze in there. So it's, it's, it's capturing something mm -hmm. sort of impressionistic. And it's one of these things that, you know, this is not Picasso. Yeah. It's not better uh, than the best painter, but I would say that it's, it's, at this point it's better than the average person. Oh, absolutely. These are, I would say these are, you know, what you would see like in a college studio art uh, project. Certainly better than any you know, high schooler can do with painting. So that's actually very impressive. <coughs> now there's one, a few down here, which are actually abstract. Uh, which kind of came uh, purely, right. or is it this one that came purely from right. the robot's imagination? That's right. So, yeah, so yeah. a lot of these paintings are, you know, the robot is staring at something here, yeah. staring at a house and it's painting yeah. it. So it's an impression of, of yep. that painting. It was looking at a photo of a house? At a photo of okay, a house yeah. uh, or at a photo of apples uh -huh. uh, or it could do, do it through a live camera. Yeah. Uh, There's a painting of my parents. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, what we're seeing here is we're telling the robot, you know, based on everything you've seen around uh -huh. the world, and it's seen millions of images in the web, yeah, yeah. on the web, paint something new that uh -huh. you haven't seen. And, yeah. uh, and it painted this thing. Uh, so right this, is, uh, this is sort of more of a, uh, this is a sort of more abstract kind of painting. And uh, you can sort of see the kind of, uh, uh, it, it called it a vase. Uh -huh. So you can sort of see maybe yeah, yeah. what kind of something it, it, it thought up its yeah. own name for vase? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, wow. but, but I think, you know, this is, again, it's not... Uh, you know, when, when we talk about robotic art, there's always mm -hmm. this question, uh, okay, this maybe is art produced by a robot, yeah. but is the robot an artist? Right, right. Is it really, is, is it 
painting uh, out of its own experience. And this is maybe one of the first examples of something like that. The, this, this, an image like this doesn't exist in the real world, uh -huh. but it's actually generated through sort of deep learning uh, processes. So I think we're in the cusp of a new era also in art, and just yeah. like uh, you know, cameras uh, changed art yeah. and moved art away from sort of realism to impressionism, uh, we're seeing sort of robots might actually change art again yeah. uh, and you know, push art uh, forward to, to other places where, uh, where robots can't reach yet. Um, is there anything that, uh, well, we'll return over here, uh, anything that's inherently human that you don't think robots would ever be able to do? No. No. Okay. I think, Fair enough. I think, uh, I think eventually, uh, you know, there's, uh, it, you know, if, if it's all sort of uh, mechanizable uh, mm -hmm. in the end, but I think the more exciting thing is are, what, what sort of, what other things that humans can't do yeah. that robots will be able to do. So we think about art, we think about poetry, we think about music. These mm -hmm. are sort of, you know, relatively constrained forms of expression. What other forms of expression are mm -hmm. there? that we haven't thought about yet. Right, and right. I think once, uh, once we sort of unleash this, this uh, new form of creativity, we're gonna get new things mm -hmm. that uh, we just don't have words for right now. Um, now, on your website a lot, you use the term, or if I saw it in there, uh, artificial life. Um, I don't know, what, define artificial life. So artificial life is sort of a field within robotics okay. and artificial intelligence, which tries to sort of uh, generate uh, life forms from scratch, using mm -hmm. mostly ideas inspired from biological evolution. Mm -hmm. So there are other robots that we have on our website yeah. that uh, were not designed by a human. This, this particular robot was designed by a human. Mm -hmm. But the robots that were designed uh, by a process of breeding, by a process of evolution, so thousands of generations of mm -hmm. thousands of robots competing and cooperating, and eventually some of the robots sort of become more... Without any human interaction. Without any human interaction. Any human yeah, interaction. Yeah. This all it's happens amazing. in the background for thousands of generations yeah. uh, in sort of this uh, simulated yeah. uh, uh, virtual world. Mm -hmm. And eventually some robots sort of reproduce there and they become sort of more prominent because they're more capable in some way. Mm -hmm. And those robots sort of take over that world. And it's interesting to sort of sit back and watch this world, see mm -hmm. all these robots... Uh, sort of evolve there and you know see what what, what happens so in so broadly speaking we call this artificial life and you know there's a practical element to it you know mm -hmm. can we design better robots that way yep. but there's also it allows us to sort of study evolutionary processes mm -hmm. uh, in a sort of a new world mm -hmm. uh, outside of our physical world okay now one of the things I've heard about we're we kind of go back onto where like humans replacing or, or humans being replaced by robots is uh, one of the things I've heard about is um, that Amazon, the only thing that's stopping them from completely automating their warehouses is that robots have trouble picking up objects of different sizes, at least right now. Uh, so actually, maybe we'll talk about this project a little. Um, I don't know, is that still, do you, would you agree with that um, estimation that, that that's kind of one of the barriers for robotics right now is picking up different sized objects? Well, I would say this is sort of a very practical kind of limitation yeah, yeah. for particular things. I don't think it's sort of... Uh, meh the grand challenge of robotics, okay. but I would say it's a, it's a grand challenge when it comes to sort of uh, robots that in t can interact with daily life. If okay. you want a robot at home that can do things, you want it, uh, you don't want a vacuum uh, cup that picks up only yeah. flat things. Well, you want to have something that can pick up any kind of shape, and that's definitely a Well, let's talk about this project. Now, when you think of robots, you usually think of like all the mechanical parts and clunking around, but there's also a field of, of soft robotics. I don't know if this counts as that, but this is a very uh, novel approach to robotics. Can you describe what's going on here? So, what we, so we were thinking, okay, can we redesign, can we rethink the robotic hand? Uh -huh. Uh, and what we came up with here is a, is a really trivial idea. It's a, basically a party balloon mm -hmm. filled with ground coffee. Mm -hmm. And if you ever handle the ground coffee, you know, it's sort of uh, in a bag, it's sort of mushy and conforms to any shape. Yeah. But if you've ever handled a vacuum-packed uh, coffee, you know, it's solid as a brick. So yeah. this uh, transition between solid and, and fluid uh, happens almost instantaneously when you pull a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is a, is a party balloon full of ground coffee, just regular off-the-shelf ground coffee. Mm -hmm. You push it against any shape and it conforms to that shape. And then we pull a tight uh, a vacuum. It takes a fraction of a second through this tube here. And suddenly this thing that was very soft suddenly becomes hard, yeah. hard as a brick. And it grabs whatever it was touching in a very, very strong force. So basically it's a very, very simple universal gripper, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And it can pick up things that conventional robots have a very hard time handling, things mm -hmm. like springs and, and wires and even it can pick up a coin from a table which wow. is 
the, the one yeah. of the biggest challenges for conventional robots to mm -hmm. pick, and it can do that all with the same tool. So uh -huh. we think there are a lot of applications from sort of industrial applications mm -hmm. to prosthetics, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's fairly new, and we'll have to see where it goes. Uh, you said that, it, that that is not the grand challenge of robotics. Uh, what, what's a what's a grand challenge right now? Well, you know, every, if you ask every robotist, you yeah. get a different answer. To me, the grand challenge is self-awareness. Okay. okay. So right now, all of these robots are sort of programmed directly or indirectly by a human yeah. uh, engineer that's sitting outside and deciding what the goals are. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and there's a lot of effort both building every robot and also uh, sort of uh, programming every robot. But mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the grand challenges is to make robots that are self-aware, that mm -hmm. can model themselves, and therefore can use that model to plan on their own. and and sort of program themselves and even recover from un, uh, unanticipated situations, mm -hmm. which is what we'll need if we really want robots to sort of take care of themselves. Now, you've, uh, we've seen a lot of like software, especially like an AI, has been able to defeat humans at uh, various tasks. We saw Watson, I guess, uh, uh, five years ago or so now, right. uh, defeat humans at uh, Jeopardy, but we've recently seen a, a, a robot defeat a human at Go, uh, and then uh, I think back in the late 90s, uh, the first robot beat a human at chess. That's right. So, um, so I mean, the, the AI, the software side, is going you know, leaps and bounds. Uh, and now we're coming along, you know, and we've seen some really interesting um, like video of different robotics coming out recently, like from Boston Dynamics and other companies like that. Do you think uh, in the distant future, or in the not so distant future, a robot will beat a human at a sport? Um, yes, if I, I have no no doubt about that. I don't know when, uh, at what point, and at yeah. what uh, uh, you know. It uh, you can even see robots that can play, let's say, ping pong, yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Uh, you can see, uh, but they can't yet defeat the best they can't, players. Can't defeat. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a that's a good question yeah. in the sense that sort of playing board games is sort of difficult, yeah. but it's not the ultimate thing for for the for a physical robot. The yeah. ultimate challenge is reality. Right. Physical reality. So robot. So uh, so AI can handle sort of these virtual worlds like Go and, and chess and, and checkers. It's very hard to uh, for AI to handle the possibilities, the almost infinite possibilities, uh, infinite number of decisions uh, that you have to make when you live in the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's sort of a much harder game, if you like. Right. Right. Uh, long term consequences and so forth. So sport is is mm -hmm. definitely sort of the the, the beginning, but but. Uh, Let's say even driving a car across a Manhattan intersection yeah. uh, is a lot more difficult than playing uh, Go. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot more things that can happen, a lot more decisions you have to make in a fraction of a second, and that's uh, sort of for a long time has been uh, the, the sort of almost impossible challenge for AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we, uh, nice segue, because we're actually going to talk about your book now. This is about driverless cars, which is kind of like the ultimate robot. Now, this is going to be the biggest disruption, I think, you know, in the world over the, at least over the next 10, 15 years. Okay, so a lot of companies, uh, now, from what I understand, um, is that driverless cars, they kind of already work, but we really have some legal and some, you know, uh, you know, acceptance issues that we had need sure. to overcome. Um, so a lot of companies are now saying that for production, um, they're going to have driverless cars by the early 2020s, something as earlier as the year 2020, so that's not that long away. Um, so I don't know, what kind of timeline do you see for driverless cars as far as when they're going to be out and when they go mainstream? So, you know, I, I, uh, I agree that uh, mm -hmm. uh, with you that's the biggest disruption coming yeah. our way, maybe sort of the, the scale of the internet. Right. And I think a lot of people don't uh, sort of... It's an expansion people, of the internet, really. Yes, yeah, and yeah. a lot of people underestimate this. They yeah. think, oh, driverless car, it's a taxi without a driver, but I'm, I'm not in the taxi business, you yeah. know, whatever. But, but really, it's a disruption with a ripple effect across the economy. And, right. and it's, it's, a, it's fascinating to just think about it, and that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, Melba Kerman and I co-authored this book, is mm -hmm. to try to bring these ideas uh, uh, into, the, into the real world mm -hmm. and get, get, uh, get people to appreciate... Uh, so sort of this wave of uh, disruption that's uh, coming our way. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. We've got a viewer who's asking, is anyone thinking about the ramifications of the energy required to run all these robots? How much power does something like that robot arm uh, use? So, uh, so that's a great question. The, the, the specific uh, energy consumption of robots, I think right now is not particularly... Uh, uh, something that people are thinking about. So that's a good question. Uh, most people are concerned mostly about sort of the the, um, the uh, performance of the robot, mm -hmm. how well it can do, and so forth. But there is reason to believe, for example, that a car driven by software is going to be more efficient than a car driven by by humans. Mm -hmm. So you can get efficiency 
gains uh, that way. Mm -hmm. But more sort of more, more broadly, if you think about you know the the way that uh, solar cells are uh, improving exponentially, right. uh, sort of power is not sort of the the big constraint that's going to mm -hmm. hold us back really. Um, so, and then we'll talk back to driverless cars. Um, what do you think are some of the big changes that people aren't thinking about um, are going to be? Like, uh, I've heard that like it's going to just reshape urban, you know, environments because we're going to have smaller roads because uh, the cars can also go much, uh, you know, they can go much closer together. There'll be no more parking lots because they, you know, or at least not near the city centers anymore. That's right. So, um, I don't know, what are, what, are, like, what are the things that people aren't yeah. expecting? That, that, that's, the, that's the, you know, at this point sort of people have uh, really thinking about all the different angles of this yeah. uh, technology. But, yeah, so the way that urban uh, landscape will change from parking lots to the fact that people even can uh, live further away because yeah. now they can commute more easily. Mm -hmm. uh, but also people can live uh, more densely because there's no parking lots right. and so forth. So cities will be de decongested. Yeah. Uh, so there's going to be a, a, a massive transition in yeah. real estate, which right. is very difficult to predict. It's sort of... I think uh, you know what we predict in the book is there's going to be a hollowing out of commuting right. uh, neighborhoods that are neither far away nor close, right. and uh, people will move either to centers of city or far away. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think there's going to be a, a, f a fascinating, um, uh, you know, new opportunities, new business models right, uh, right. opened up, and this is one of the, the really interesting things. Uh, just like the internet created completely new business models that nobody had anticipated mm -hmm. uh, before. What happens when, uh, for example, you know, we t tend to think about driverless cars as moving humans without a driver, but they can also move goods without a driver. So you're talking about trucking industry that's going to be revolutionized. You're talking about small pods now that yeah. can move around in a very small and fast and zip around and move things. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, sending a pizza, yeah. uh, usually uh, you have a whole truck with a, a driver and a small pizza inside. Yeah. You don't need that anymore. You can right. just send a pizza in a tiny pod. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, you, so suddenly if people are buying online, they can have the pods show up with the things they're buying. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have uh, also, uh, you, you know, you can imagine situations just like you're willing to, to accept ads on your web page uh -huh. because it gives you content for free. Imagine that you go somewhere and uh, some sponsor said, okay, we're going to go. And on you go, your route is going to be five minutes longer, but you're going to stop at this parking lot next to a food chain. Yeah. And you're going to sit there for three minutes, right, right. Uh, and we'll pay your gas. Right. Will you accept that? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, and uh, you know, so, so new opportunities yeah. there that are begin to happen. But there's also, uh, you know, there's 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 uh, potentially better environmental impact, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also sort of negative aspects. We'll have sort of more cars. Yeah. Uh, more energy consumption. But less people owning cars. Uh, yeah. Possibly yeah. Uh, less ownership, but more cars. Right. So it's good news if you're producing cars, if yeah. you're a car manufacturer, if you're looking for a job in yeah. manufacturing cars, we're going to be producing more cars. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be needing more mechanics. We're going to be needing more people to service roads. Uh -huh. So there's going to be a lot more jobs, uh, contrary to other uh, But a lot less dead people from road fatalities is probably and the biggest thing. Right. Yeah. right. So yeah. probably the biggest impact is, uh, yeah. is uh, life savings. Right now yeah. there are 23,000 people every week wow. dead because of cars across the world. Yeah. 23,000. I mean, that's it's a, a stadium every year. That's a, that's a nuclear, yeah. Hiroshima-scale nuclear bomb going yeah. off every month. Yeah. And we're completely oblivious to it because it's we sort of we've, we've come to to live with this kind of necessary evil. Yeah. But that can go away. So, you know, there's there's uh, there's it's it's just a, a ripple effect throughout the economy, which uh, is uh, as good sides as bad sides. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to cover both both angles in this book, uh, mm -hmm. not to just uh, have a breathless uh, uh, excitement, but uh, but it is going to be uh, you know uh, uh, something we'll we'll won't be able to look back and understand mm -hmm. how we we got it. Around without mm -hmm. uh, without driverless cars, um, and, then, and then like starting to wrap up here, uh, your favorite robot from science fiction. Oh, that's a that's a that's a tough one. Yeah, um, that's a really tough one. You know, I have to say, I grew up in the in the Star Wars uh, era, yeah. so that's definitely the you know the future. next generation era. Yes. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so uh, so that's uh, that's a sort of uh, robots, but it's yeah. interesting to see how uh, I think uh, in some ways. Science fiction sort of uh, is ahead of robotics, but in yeah. some ways so it's, uh, it's behind. Yeah, yeah. And you can still see science fiction movies where there's people driving a car in yeah, yeah. 100 years from now in a chase or something. Yeah. So there's all be 
all of things are going to change. Okay, and then we're going to end up with the with lightning round that we kind of same questions that we ask every guest. Um, are you a Windows or Mac? Windows. All right. Uh, Android or iOS? iOS. All right. Um, what was a recent piece of technology that you've come in contact with and you thought, wow, living in the future? Oh, the, uh, you know, virtual reality. Okay. Did you try like uh, Oculus or something? Uh, or? Yeah, Oculus, Vive, all yeah, of yeah. those, yes. And, and it's definitely, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. It's yeah. a double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to change humanity in a, in a profound way. Wow. Um, where do you get your daily news and information from? Like uh, Twitter or Facebook or how do you, how do you get, where does, how does information get to you? You know, when you're in your university, you yeah. don't have to do much. People talk about sure. everything all the time. The, uh, through my Old students. School. Analog. Yeah, Analog. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Voice. Uh, yeah. Um, Ed Snowden, traitor or hero? Uh, well, tricky one. Yeah. He, uh, hero in my mind. Okay. Um, will the singularity occur in 2054, as Ray Kurzweil predicts? What uh, date did he predict? Uh, 2054. 2054? Yeah. Sounds about right, okay. but, for the, but for a different reason. Oh, okay. Would, uh, explain. <laughs> yeah. So, so he predicted because of, sort of the, the computing power, curve, yeah. but I think really it's, it's uh, algorithms that are moving forward. So right. just computing power is not enough, okay. but the algorithms are moving in that direction as well, and that's really so uh, we, they're going to change. If we make it to 2054, you get to live forever. <laughs> no, that's the point. Well, yeah. the singularity in many yeah. ways is the point where AI is good enough to, to create new AI. Right, right, right. right. And that, that's the thing that's going to happen at that time. Gotcha. Um, is there intelligent life out there? Yes, but gotcha. it's uh, playing video games. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, is Bigfoot out there? <laughs> around, I mean, around here? Not, not around here. Okay. Uh, and what is a recent task, little or big, that you've been able to master? So kind of like updating your own OS. Oh, okay. I've been uh, yeah. trying hard to learn how to program GPUs. Okay. This, uh, this massively How's it going? parallel. Yeah. It's, going, uh, it's going okay, okay. but uh, with a little bit of help with the students, uh -huh. uh, it's, uh, I think I'm going to take off. All right. Sounds good. Okay, so for everyone at home, um, give us a like, give us a share if you're watching us for the first time. We appreciate those. Uh, and also check out some of our past interviews. Uh, I should also announce that The Convo is just uh, last week is now available as an audio podcast. You can uh, subscribe on iTunes or subscribe on any um, uh, ser podcast service that you use. On, on iTunes especially, give us a subscribe, give us a like, give us a review, a positive review. We really appreciate those. Um, thanks to everyone at home. Thanks to anyone who's um, participated in the conversation. Thanks to social Pete, uh, and as always, be good to each other. Peace.